Welcome back to our series of videos on compression vaults. This particular video focusing on hyperbolic paraboloid surfaces with boundary edges on the geometric directrices of the hyperbolic paraboloid surface. In previous videos, we examined some of the geometric and structural properties of this structure, which is based on the hyperbolic paraboloid shape. This is the, ch the key geometric form, which can be generated by starting with a single parabola. In this case, uh, in this particular coordinate system, it's y equal minus kx squared. I want to remind everyone that X and Z are defining the horizontal pl plane and the Y coordinate is vertical, which is the standard way for laying out coordinate systems in structural analysis software. We can duplicate and rotate that parabola through a 90 degree angle to produce the second parabola. So we started with this one. We duplicated it and rotated it 90 degrees. The first parabola was y equals minus kx squared. This is the z coordinate. In this case, the equation for this parabola is y equals minus kz squared. We can then mirror that parabola about the horizontal plane, which is the cx plane to produce this parabola which is y equals plus kz squared. We can take this parabola and we can sweep it along this parabola and when I say sweep it I mean we're going to generate a series of parabolas that have exactly the same shape and orientation of this original one except this center point on that parabola will now get replicated here and here and here and so forth to produce this shape. So we've swept that upwardly opening parabola along this downwardly opening parabola to produce this particular shape. And now we can take this downwardly opening parabola and sweep it along the original upwardly opening parabola to produce this shape. So every one of these parabolas has the same constant of proportionality. They all have exactly the same shape, except that one family is opening upward and the other is opening downward. Every one of these parabolas was in a vertical plane. So when we look at this in the plan view, this geometric form presents a grid of small squares within a larger uh, boundary square, which is this right here. So even though it's a fairly complex and rich shape, uh, these elements can be replicated to cover large areas and each one of these hyperbolic paraboloids constitutes a simple square in the plan of that structure. We can begin to connect points along diagonals so we can snap from here to there to there to there um, and produce what looks like another square. In three dimensions it looks like this. So we'd like to go to our active graphic file and look at how that behaves. So this is that basic geometry. Um, we have snapped a bunch of diagonals here and a bunch of diagonals along there and around the structure to produce the original square, but just for drill, We've also snapped a bunch of other diagonals together to produce this series of elements strung together. We would like to understand what are the geometry, what is the geometry of those elements that are snapped along the diagonals. 
Um, in order to understand that, we're going to rotate this around a little bit. You notice that this member now in this view appears to be uh, parallel to this edge of the image, or in other words, it appears to be a vertical line within the context of this drawing, as does this one and that one. We would like to demonstrate that each of these is a straight line. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to add a member here and we're going to snap it down there and it appears to be lying directly on top of all those members down below. Now, we don't know that this is necessarily uh, collinear with all those members, but we do know that if all of those members are obscured directly behind the line that we just drew, that all those members exist in a vertical plane. They may not be collinear, but they exist in a vertical plane. Now, I'm going to undo what I just did because that member was only introduced to uh, establish a certain geometric point. And now I would like to look at all these elements and I'm going to rotate this structural form in this direction. And you'll notice as I rotate it, I'm keeping my eye on this line right here. We know that that collection of elements is in a vertical plane. We don't know whether they're all collinear or not. But if we rotate and continue to rotate and we arrive at that point where all of those members reduce down in this view to a single point, which means they're all collinear and they're all on a straight line. Now I can go rotate this across and each time I encounter one of those diagonal collections of segments, they all reduce down to a single point, which means every single one of those collections of members that were established by snapping on the diagonals, every single one of those is a straight line. This collection of straight lines, and by the way, just to prove the point, I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees, and I'm going to go through that same exercise again, where I'll start by rotating and, and establishing that that outer uh, straight line is in fact a straight line. And as I go across here, every one of those collections of segments reduces down to a single point. So we know that those are all straight lines. These are, by the way, called the geometric directrices. And they are not structural. So I'm going to make the following point. I'm going to select all of, uh, excuse me, I want to select member labels, and those are directrices. And then I'm going to turn those off for the moment. I could delete them. But for the moment, I want to just mask them and go back to that image. So all of those elements are non-structural. They could be used to generate the form. For example, you could create a formwork structure that goes along all those straight lines. So I'll go back and redraw those. So. You could have a formwork that follows a straight line and more formwork that follows that one, or you could choose this set of straight lines. And you could use that as a way of establishing the appropriate shape for this surface. But those are not structural members, and they will not be part of the final design. So I'm going to do this. Now, we don't have to take this entire um, form as our structure. We can select all of that, and we can delete that. And just to make sure I grab all the right stuff, I'm going to come rotate this a little bit. And then I'll rotate it 90 degrees again.
and I have a new structural form, which, by the way, gets a little challenging to see in this particular format. Um, I'm going to render these elements. And in this structure, by the way, um, these blue elements are going to be in compression. These green elements are going to be in tension. And every time they come to a boundary, this blue element is pushing out on the boundary. This green element is pulling in on the boundary. So there's no net force perpendicular to the boundary. But the compression force in this member is exerting some compression in the boundary member. The tension force in this member has a component along this boundary member, which is also causing compression. So every time we cross over a point in the structure, we add more and more force in this boundary member. So the boundary member in the end is going to be one of the most heavily loaded members in the structure. The support, of course, will be down at these base points here and here. So that gives you the general behavior of this structure. We can um, take some of these and connect them together. So here you'll notice we've created a hyperbolic paraboloid. Uh, we said that the compression in this edge member intensifies the further we go down because every time we cross over a joint, this compression member and that tension member conspire to add to the force in this boundary element. Uh, so the boundary element is rendered as getting thicker and thicker as it goes down towards the base. So here we have one of these. We've replicated it by 90 degrees to produce that one, by 90 degrees again to produce this one, and then finally by 90 degrees again to produce that. And these four hyperbolic paraboloids are bracing each other and covering space, and they're sharing a high point here where their tips are high. Uh, but also notice that this edge plus that edge plus that one plus this one in the back here are forming a pyramid which becomes the stable structure off of which all of these uh, individual structures are stabilized. Now this member should have about half the force in it of this one because this one is getting forces from these por that portion of the structure plus from that portion whereas this edge is only getting force from this portion of one structure. So we could simplify the construction by saying this boundary edge will not be different from that one if we basically say we're going to take four of these individual structural systems and we're just going to put them side by side and then we're going to brace them together with some sort of truss work. So they are helping to stabilize each other but basically, this compression edge right here can then be identical in cross-section to that compression edge. And this compression edge right here can be identical to that compression edge. In fact, all these compression edges in this particular structure will be the same. Now, we can do further variations on that by splitting these hyperbolic paraboloids further apart so the truss work now has been opened up and we might choose to do this as a way of introducing light in the center of this structure. Uh, again, these are hyperbolic paraboloids except uh, they are no longer aligned to the vertical. Um, they have a different control direction in each case because they've been tilted over. This is a Felix Candela designed structure which is based on saddle surfaces laced together with trusses, similar to the concept we just talked about, except this is a saddle surface which does not follow the precise 
uh, geometric construction of a hyperbolic paraboloid. It lacks some of the symmetry of a hyperbolic paraboloid, but it's structurally very similar. Um, if I recall correctly, this was a restaurant um, which has this nice light from the boundary, and then in the center of the structure where it would tend to be a little darker, light is introduced at the center. Um, he used this in this case for a restaurant, but it's a form that also works well for churches, and he used it uh, in that application also. Um, this shows a series of high pars that uh, are not replicated all the way around the high point. They're just connected at the tip. So there are, there are two high pars connected here and two high pars connected there. Um, they are consequently stabilizing, stabilizing each other because, again, we have this pyramid consisting of those edges plus these two edges here. So we have a four-sided pyramid which is the source of stability for this structure. This is an example of a structure that was not benefited by being connected to any other structure. Um, this was designed and built by some students of Zubi Zubinzaretta when he was teaching at the College of Design one semester, and the focus of his class was on hyperbolic paraboloids. In this case, uh, it's a steel-reinforced concrete structure. It was around the College of Design for more than a decade. Um, it was very structurally sound, except, of course, for the fact that it rotates about this axis right here. So it would often be found in a variety of uh, um, geometric configurations, depending on who was playing with it the last time. Uh, it got used by skateboarders and people who would do various kinds of gymnastic athletic uh, activities associated with it. In general, it was kind of a hazard um, being an attractive nuisance that people really liked to play with. It is possible to take a single hyperbolic paraboloid and create a structure out of it. Um, some mechanism, though, for keeping it from tipping over is crucial in this particular uh, uh, rendering. We've shown a series of vertical columns uh, that wrap all the way around the structure, and they can serve very effectively to keep it from tipping over. Um, there are structural ramifications and challenges associated with this arrangement, particularly having to do with the deflection of the hyperbolic paraboloid and the influence of these rigid columns tending to poke through the hyperbolic paraboloid. And we're going to discuss all of those ramifications and challenges in our next video, which is going to focus on the Catalano house. That ends our video on hyperbolic paraboloids with the boundaries on the director sees.